I am very, very deeply honored. Can you hear me? And also deeply touched to be here today. To start with, I want to apologize because I am not going to address you as individuals because all of, who, all of you who are here are very, very important people. You are here because you are important. So take it that I am addressing a very important group of people. Also, if I address individuals, I always leave out someone. <laughs> and after the meeting, they always come and remind me. You left that person out. So I don't want to get, go to that, that again. This is a nuisance. I switch off my phone, but it's ringing. <laughs> so, uh, this is the pro problem with technology. So it is completely off, I think. Uh, <coughs> but to start with, before I read my <coughs> lecture, which unfortunately I'll be reading, I am doing something that I have never done in my life. That is, I am wearing a suit in a university lecture. <laughs> I am not a banker. I am an academic and a cowboy. So the last time I wore a suit was in my son's wedding, which is the same suit that I am wearing today. <laughs> And this is the second time I'm wearing a suit. And normally I wear a suit at a funeral or at a wedding, but not at a university lecture. So I'm breaking a record. Because I want to honor my friend P.S. Laurie. He was a formal man. And he was a decent man, and he always wore a tie. So in order to honor him, I took out my suit from my box and ironed it and wearing it today. Just a few words about Lorraine as I know him. I've, I knew him for 40 years. I, he was my colleague and friend for 40 years. We first met uh, in Shillong when he was doing his research and I was doing my, <coughs> my research. And then later on we worked together in many organizations and the last one was Forum for Naga Reconciliations. Reconciliation. And I always remember Lorin as a righteous man. He was not a saint but he was a righteous man. And the thing that he always talked about in Forum for Nagari Reconciliation is, he wanted us to become righteous. And he wanted Naga nation to become a righteous nation. Of course, we failed to create the Naga nation to become a righteous nation, as you already know, but that is our vision and our hope that we can pursue to become a righteous nation as my friend Lorraine had hoped for. I very, very, very vividly remember when he brought his young wife to Shillong, a very little cute little girl, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, I said, oh, uh, he, he came to my home. I said, oh, you didn't invite me for your wedding. I said, oh, too expensive. I make it simple. <laughs> so, so that was, I remember that one. Now, I have to read my lecture, unfortunately, because I can't uh, remember all of it. And reading is not often easy. And also, um, not as interesting as delivering an oral lecture. Nevertheless, it is written, 
and it is researched, so I shall read and do my best. To start with, I'll start with a quotation from Professor Jan van Sina, the founder of the father of oral tradition as history. He said, whether memory changes or not, culture is reproduced by remembrance put into words and deeds. The mind through the memory carries culture from generation to generation. How it is possible for a mind to remember and out of nothing to spin complex ideas, messages, and instruction for living, which manifests continuity over time is one of the greatest wonders one can study. Comparable only to human intelligence and thought itself, oral tradition should be central to students of ideology, of society, of psychology, of art, and finally, of history. Jan van Sina, Wisconsin. The book is called Oral History as History. We know, of course, that human beings exist in time and space. The events and experience, thank you, that make us make up our lives occur at some time in some place and work in, in a dynamic interactive relationship. So, remembering is not a simple phenomenon, but being able to remember and recount what our lives are made is of central to our sense who we are and who might who we might become both as as individual and as people we know too that foundational categories of time and place and the constitutive experience of becoming occur in a complex environmental and social context we broadly refer to as culture. Nagas have a rich repository of oral traditions, being home to hundreds of tribes and languages. They are the meeting point of Tibeto Burman and Indo Aryan languages and culture. Each tribe has a unique tradition, culture, and histories, with which with much still remaining to be explored. The diversity of culture, language, and tradition of Naga tribes have much to offer to the world as it continues to evolve. Fortunately, we now have many competent and re reflective research scholars who are tapping into this precious mother load of stories, tradition, and oral histories. In addition, with the onset of the new technology, the living cultures and ancient stories are being recorded in the community events and festivals in villages across the region, as we did today. These traditional oral accounts where our ancients and elders speak and interact people even on their mobile phone, uh, interact across generations are being captured on film including the video by every, everyday people even on their mobile phones and uploaded to social media as instant virtual record. So the community has become available in a new ways. It is, its voices reach us in multiple modes with greater immediacy than was ever before possible. This is for most part a positive and promising development. I open my talk with epigra an epigraph 
a quote from the famous historian Jan van Sina, because his words have a bearing on the cultures of the Nagas. It was Van Sina who laid the foundation for a worldwide theoretical framework for research in oral history. Let me reiterate his key idea on the relationship between memory and culture. <clears throat> Quote, whether memory changes or not, culture is reproduced by remembrance put into words and deeds. Quote. What he says here about the pivotal role of memory, inflected by repeated narration and lived experience, is critical to keeping alive the immensely rich and diverse culture. Until recently, most of our histories and indigenous culture existed in form of oral tradition. We knew all alone, of course, that the lives and minds of, the, of our ancestors from century past were continually recorded in the living memories and performative artists of the successive elders and storytellers and passed down from passed down generation. We, so we are receptive to modern scholars like mm -hmm. Van Sina, who speak of the centrality of oral tradition, oral culture in human development and society, societal evolution as a whole. If, as Van Sina argues, transmittable memory is in this inseparable from the very working of the human mind, then oral history to indigenous society like the Nagas is the book of life itself. The main takeaway from both Vansina and oral traditions of indigenous people is that a living culture is one that renews itself through iterative narration and progressive enactment of evolutionary growth. This is the reason behind Van Sina taking his argument one step further and recommending that oral tradition be made a component of formal education to be it the study of ideology, of society, of psychology, of art, and finally of history. In short, it is oral culture that indigenous people like the Nagas owe their collective identity, hence also their survival and growth. Some thread from past and present. There are, a, there are serious threats to the oral traditions and the indigenous people. If oral, oral tradition can and gender and nurture its own community, as historians in indigenous culture agree it does, then if and when an an oral tradition dies, so does the community. We don't need to recite the list of cultures that have gone extinct. Too many groups have died of all together, or have disappeared themselves into the oblivion through assimilation. We also know that the threats to the people of a people with living culture can come from within and from outside forces. The people of this, of this region have faced and continue to face threats to our existence on both levels. From the 19th century to the present, we are living through a critical period of transition. A ready example of internet threats a major weakness, to say the least, is tourism culture. We often hear about cultural, cultural days and events where people wear the traditional dress, 
and costume and dance and sing and party in exotic make-believe village and venues. Occasion like the annual Hornbill Festival come to mind. This festival may serve modern day purpose and needs, but we know that they are stage shows. They are merely shadow images of our culture. There is no harm celebrating our culture for, for and along with tourists. And of course, prov provided the celebration are manifestation of a living culture within the communities. But that would require us to ensure that what we see and perform reflects the state of being in the interior life of the community that gave birth to the songs and dances in the first place. In other words, indigenous culture has meaning and value only to the degree that its narrative and performances have lived equivalence in the community down to the home and family which are basic units of any of any whole and cohesive community. Alternatively, at the very least, the tourism culture we exhibit for commercial consumption should help us recognize the absence of the equivalency in the real life and prompts critical self-examination for corrective changes. Another really example that comes in the mind is the time of, of threat from outside, where Lorraine talked about his time in the jungle. Is what happened our villages what happened to our villages several decades ago? The Indian Army burned our villages, 58, 56, even up to 60. We went in the jungle, like Lorraine and myself, hiding in the jungle for years. We then returned from the jungle and relocated to a new village, to new villages, after being displaced for so long. We experienced an unexpected social phenomenon. We went through a new cultural upheaval. What happened to our way of life as a result of a long period of displacement and suffering uh, merits recounting because it brought about something strange and remarkable. I can dis only describe it as a cultural renaissance. New songs were written, new myths and legends were created, traditions were altered, and taboos were broken out of desperation. Festivals, weddings, and funerals began to change as a result of a deep search for meaning. The physical hardship forced us to look at the world from a different perspective. Deprivation led to the changes in our food. Our belief system began to change, and many superstitions melted away. Many converted to Christianity during this period. Due to factors known and unknown to us, like my family, we became Christian in the jungle because we couldn't perform a festival anymore. Most beyond our control, including our inability to observe traditional rituals adequately and observe taboos, which we were compelled to break because of the changed circumstances. For three long years, the jungle, the jungle, um, the jungle gave us life, nurtured us, and forever changed us. The shock of physical and cultural disruption disoriented us. We were confused and shaken and were desperately searching for something within and beyond that would bring healing and meaning to our harsh 
an altered landscape. <clears throat> our worldview was so disrupted, we had to reinvent ourselves to respond. What Naga's experience from 50s to 70s was nothing short of a cultural trauma as a result of a massive physical force imposed on us from outside. The transition of the Nagas as a whole has nonetheless been one of the, one of the estrangement a prolonged disorienting separation from the oral roots and tradition that had nurtured us for centuries, probably longer. It is easy to observe the still unresolved struggle from anxiety of separation in the Naga society today. As some of you would know, the ancient Angami Sekrini festival had been dead for some years. It went through a slow death for nearly 50 years before totally disappearing. Then suddenly, recently, Christian Nangamis have revived traditional festival in a new form, the Christian way. I attended a celebration of the new birthed Sekarni by a church community in Mazipema. There were a few of us present who had experienced the traditional Sekrengi in our own lifetime. Mm -hmm. We realized that what we were observing is to this day bore absolutely no resemblance of our, our, of our ancient festival. For me, it was both a mourning and a celebration, a joy and a sadness. I was mourning, I was sad, the death of the dead of Sekrini, a precious and a beautiful part of my Angami culture that was now forever lost. At the same time, I rejoiced and embraced the birth of the new Sekrini, which is totally different from the traditional one, waiting to be given a renewed lease of life an imaginary creative ceremony in a Christian form, very much like our Christmas, which is an imaginary creative form of the pagan uh, uh, festival of the, of the European before they became Christian. It occurred to me that I was witnessing firsthand the evolution of, a, of my culture from the ancient times to the 21st century. Sekrengi was being reinvented and given a new narrative and a performative form. Celebrations like this show that we could be in a crucial moment of a cultural redefinition. Christianity is relatively new, a relatively new faith in Naga's history and culture. We know Christian theologies theology and exegesis, like in other faith traditions, are colored by and shaped by culture. The indigenous people of the Northeast, particularly the Nagas, particularly the Nagas, are now Christian. Christianity that came packaged with colonial Western culture, the early missionaries were ex extremely ethnocentric and convinced of the superiority of their faith, of their culture, and of their race. They forbade converts from, converts from performing traditional rituals and taking part in festivals. They were very particular about the formal signs of conversion. They urged convert to discard the native appearance by dressing in Western clothes and changing their hairstyle to make uh, their conversion of Christianity visible to mark their difference from the supposedly benighted past. This Eurocentric attitude undermined some of the priceless values of the indigenous culture like the Naga's sense of self and place within a cohort 
which was intimately connected to the community, community's well-being as a whole. Altogether, that of a life-giving natural ecology. The evangelical missionaries' attitude also caused social disharmony uh, in many villages and created confusion of values for generations. Taking a little break that I'm not attacking missionaries. I'm a Christian. I've studied theology. But we are all human and we make mistakes because of the involvement of the historical changes. I have not written this paper because this paper is going to be published, but I'll tell you something which is not this one. I read a, a paper of the Our Baptist uh, Convention in the early part of this century. That is, uh, of, of that last century, there's a month 100 years ago. They had a convention in Impu, and two resolutions were passed. More than 100 and, what, 120 years ago? And one was, all the our Christian women most wear saris. <laughs> I don't understand what has sari to do with Bible, but that was their resolution. And the Christian men must have their hair cut like uh, Europeans, and they should not keep that Maga hairstyle. And the Christian man either must wear half pen or dotis. <laughs> because the first uh, Christian on the Bodula or whatever, he came from Assam, and probably he was wearing dhoti. So they thought the way to be Christian was to wear dhoti. Now our children today read this and they laugh. Because you don't go to heaven by wearing skirt or wearing saris. <laughs> You go to heaven for me, from what you believe in your heart. Given this history, today's Christian communities are attempting meaningful cultural rebirth, like the celebration of Sacrini. We'll find the process perplexing, but we will need to ensure we do the right, do it right, and on two main fronts. The first is how to facilitate the transfer of the old to the new terms and ritual changes. This will require creative imagination, but will be, but will be the easy part. The, the harder task will be merging the best of the both worlds into the renewed festival communities and villages which are now for the most part Christian. How do we nurture the ancient ethos of the common good back to everyday life, such as our ancestors will find a comfortable home among us, in the churches and in the society at large? The occasional anxiety and the growing pains in the transition process should not discourage us, because in the end, the result will be deeply satisfying, it could become the starting point of a healing of our society. On a broader political front, the estrangement of this region's indigenous societies from customary forms of the government seems to be already decisive. It happened over decades. For Nagas, the disruption of the traditional institutions started with the India's repression of the freedom movement and the creation of Nagaland state, along with the introduction of a party-based rivalry in electoral politics, followed by political intrigue and infighting among Naga national factions. All this has left the Nagas physically, psychologically wounded. The effects are too deep to get into this lecture. What is more, what is more to the point here is the current socio-cultural climate in the Northeast as a whole. 
in relation to the mainland, mainland's persistent domination of the region. The central government imposition of its political will has, has a history that includes an assumption on its part of a natural inferiority of the people compared to the, to the Indians on the mainland. The Northeast satellites status was put into policy by the leaders of the newly independent Indian government back in the mid 20th century. It was consistently pursued by the successive central government and has now reached a new level. The BJB government under Modi has un unabashedly ratcheted up its dominance over the region. The governance structure built around the assumption of inferiority as has resulted in an outcast-like state of national exception for the region. But the institutional, institutionalization of inferiority has gone beyond governmental structure and policy. It has translated into a form of racism in everyday life and acts of ethnic di discrimination and open violence against Northeastern people in the mainland. Over the decades, the uneven power of power relationship has morphed into an insidious group mentality. On thinking sense of superiority on the part of the men in India and subordination fatigue for the region, even intellectuals and professionals now seem on trouble by naturalization of Nordi status as India's outcast region. Colonial history is replete with chronic problems in general among the native peoples and the world from being uprooted. You combine close to a century or longer of colonial British rule of the region with another close or century long takeover by post-colonial India and all